Sandy and I would prefer that you didn't meet disaster, financial or otherwise. But during peak hurricane season, being prepared could mean saving a ton of time, money and frustration should calamity strike. Frequent Kiplinger's contributor Kim Langford joins the show to talk disaster preparedness in our main segment. On today's show, Sandy explains why college branded debit cards aren't a good deal, and I make sure we're all getting our terms straight when it comes to market downturns. That's all ahead on this episode of Your Money's Worth. Stick around. Welcome to Your Money's Worth. I'm Kiblinger's associate editor, Ryan Ermey, joined as always by senior editor Sandy Block and continuing with our sort of back to school theme, Sandy, a story in your section in the September issue of Kiplinger's, the ahead section, uh, is something that we wanted to chat about on the podcast today. That's right. Um, A lot of uh, young people will be starting college uh, in the next few weeks. And uh, a little history here. When I was in graduate school in the early 90s, uh, everywhere you go, you'd see these tables where uh, f- set up by credit card companies. And if you signed up for credit card, you got anything from a pizza to, I remember in one case, you could get airline tickets. That's how wow. eager they were to get college students to sign up for these credit cards. Well, yeah, they were trying to get you to sign up when you were 15. <laughs> they, oh, no, I wasn't 15. <laughs> but um, I was, I like to think I was wise to the game. But um, what happened was that uh, so many college students got so mu- in so much debt that in 2009, Congress passed a law that really cut down on that. And now, unless you're 21, it's very hard to get a credit card without your parents' permission. So you don't see the credit card tables anymore, but what has sort of replaced them are debit card tables. Young okay. people going to college now will see some of these same financial institutions offering a- – promoting debit cards that are often branded with the college name. And who wouldn't want a debit card with your college alma mater on it? It sounds really cool. Um, Well, here's the problem. These financial institutions spend a lot of money to get this branding. And who do you think is paying for that? The students who get the debit cards. Students at some of these schools paid an average of 2.3 times more in fees for these branded credit cards Mm -hmm. than students that got debit cards that weren't hooked up this way. So it's not, you're not going to go into deep debt, but you could end up paying a lot more for the right to use this debit card than you would if you got a debit card from your own credit union or your parents' bank or something like that. I'm not saying that all these debit cards are bad, but you really do need to read the fine print, uh, see what the terms are, because one of the problems is oftentimes the accounts these students set up where they're when they're in school, they keep for the rest of their lives. And yeah. people are really sticky when it comes to banks. So you could be paying these high fees for many years. So what we recommend is compare the fees and rates and other things with a debit card from your credit union, um, from your local bank, you, you know, shop around because yeah. there's a lot of financial institutions. Well, you know, I went off to college with a Bank of America account because there was a Bank of America ATM in my dorm. And (laughs) I still bank with Bank of America. I I can see why students are a popular target for marketing for cards like this because college students are, at least at the college I went to, and I went to GW, um, are pretty frivolous and, dare I say, dumb with their money, which makes sense for, I mean, kids in my dorm used to, pay to get their laundry sent out <laughs> every, you know, they get like, like really like heinous stuff. And not because they like could, you know, uh, it was because a lot of them didn't know how to do laundry. How can you ensure or what is at least part of the way toward ensuring that your kid is going to be smart about debit and banking by the time they get to college? Well, that's a really good question, Ryan. And actually in our annual banking survey, uh, which we will post in the show notes. We give a couple of examples of best banks for families with students. These accounts are, are ideal for, they're, they're tailored for kids and teenagers. They let you set up an account for your teenage child that helps them learn how to manage the money with your supervision. Mm-hmm. And then you can, once the child turns 18, it can become his or her own account. But hopefully by that time they've learned. And, and these, can, you know, it, 
like all of the uh, banks in our Best Bank survey, these banks have low fees and lots of flexibility. So we'll post the show notes on this. Our our best bank for families with kids is that Capital One 360 account. Um, it's an easy to manage, no fee account. So again, you know, you're setting your child off on the right foot. They're already starting out with a no fee account. If they keep that account into adulthood, more's the better. And if you can teach them how to do laundry as well. <laughs> I, I, there was a girl in my um, sorority house who didn't know she had to change her sheets. Oh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, prepare your kids financially and just in life skills. My goodness. <laughs> Will your homeowner's insurance cover flood damage? That depends. Find out if you're prepared for hurricane season next. For the complete economic outlook and trustworthy forecasts for your business and investments, rely on the unbiased advice and guidance in the weekly Kiplinger letter. Most sources merely report business news after it happens. By then, it's too late to do anything about it. But the Kiplinger letter alerts you to what's likely to happen next in business, the economy, and financial markets, giving you precious time to plan ahead to profit or protect your interests. Download a free issue and see for yourself. No information is required from you. Visit store.kiplinger.com today. That's store.kiplinger.com. We're back and we're here with Kiplinger's contributing writer, Kim Lankford. And we thought it would be a good time to have Kim on because she is a master of all things disaster preparedness and we are <laughs> headed into the master of disaster. <laughs> we're headed into peak hurricane season coming up. So Kim, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. So what does your homeowner's insurance actually cover in the case of a possible disaster? And where might it be coming up short? Well, especially considering that it's hurricane season and the peak hurricane season runs through the end of August through September. So it's a really good time to be thinking about this. There's two key issues. Your homeowner's insurance generally covers damages caused by wind, like wind-driven rain and um, things like that. If anything happens to your roof, if anything comes through your windows. However, any water that comes from the bottom up is considered flooding and that isn't covered by homeowner's insurance. And so in Hurricane Katrina, Katrina, um, in, in many of the hurricanes that have happened since then, especially Hurricane Harvey, this was a huge issue because some of the damages were covered by homeowners insurance and some were considered flooding and aren't covered by the policies. Yeah. And Kim, um, I interviewed someone recently who uh, I think he was one of your regular sources who said that unless you live on top of a mountain, you should have flood insurance because even people who live outside traditional flood zones have had flooding and things like Harvey. So the question is, it, given that, where do you go to get flood insurance and how much does it cost? That's a great point because in Houston, for example, a lot of people who are not considered to be in flood zones ended up getting flooding. And a lot of it is because when there's new development going on in a community, it changes the runoff. And so a lot of times you can get flood damage even if your you know, mortgage company didn't require you to get flood coverage. The key place that people have gone traditionally is the National Flood Insurance Program, NF and you can go to floodsmart.gov and get information about their policies. But in several states, especially Florida and Texas, there's also a growing private um, flood insurance marketplace. So you may also want to talk with your homeowner's insurance agent to find out if they can sell you the national flood insurance program, but also if there's competing policies from the um, from private insurers. And you know, if, if you're in a low-risk area, it might just cost you about you know $450 a year to get the maximum coverage um, from the federal program. If you're in a higher risk area, it could be hundreds or even thousands of dollars a year. And that's where it's really good to comparison shop. So, you know, floods are obviously an issue. Hurricanes are an issue. But, you know, you look at the news and there's tornadoes, there's wildfires. It's an absolute disaster out there. <laughs> uh, what will my home what will my homeowner's insurance cover in the case of, say, a tornado or a wildfire? And what am I going to be out? Well, the 
key thing with the tornadoes and wildfires is generally the damages are covered by your homeowner's insurance. You don't have the issue of the wind versus water that you do with hurricanes. You usually have to pay your deductible. And uh, so make sure that you have enough money in your emergency fund to be able to cover that. But the key thing with some of those things like wildfires and, and tornadoes is that a lot of times the home is a total loss. And that's where it's really important to keep up to date with your amount of insurance coverage. Um, talk with your agent, talk with your insurance company if you've done any renovations to make sure they know about all of the you know high quality materials that you've used. If you've added an addition, just make sure you have enough coverage because especially with the California wildfires, a lot of people fell short with that. They went to rebuild their homes and they didn't have enough coverage in order to do finish the whole job. So um, Kim, what about um, living expenses? A lot of times people are put out of their homes for months um, as, as you said, you know, if, if the home is completely destroyed. Um, does your insurance cover most of that? It generally does. And this is actually really important. This, if you have a, you know, total loss and you're out of your house for a while while it's being fixed, this is one of the first checks that you might get, um, especially during a Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Harvey. I talked to a lot of people after both of those hurricanes, and they were very surprised that uh, they would get the coverage to pay for the hotel um, and other additional living expenses while their house was being fixed. And sometimes it can cover you for up to a year of those expenses, which can be very, very valuable if you're in, in an area where there was a hurricane and everyone is competing for contractors at the same time. A lot of times it can take, you know, much longer to get your home repaired than it usually would. So keep track of those receipts when you're outside of your house and talk with your insurance company. Even sometimes they'll give you a debit card to be able to cover some of those expenses or might send you a check, just a check up front in order to start covering those expenses. That can give you some cash to get started with everything right after the disaster. Is there a limit to where I can stay? I mean, I surely can't check into the to the Ritz for a couple months <laughs> while they're rebuilding my house, can I? <laughs> They, they they do say that it does have to be of you know, the same type of level of of what you were coming from. So you need okay. to work with okay. your insurance company right. agents <laughs> to make sure exactly. Oh, yeah. They're going to be careful about how much they give you. <laughs> you don't know how large I'm with. I'm living high up on the hogs. Uh. <laughs> okay, but Kim, what about your stuff? Um, obviously, you know, you when people's houses burn down or are wiped out by a tornado or even by a flood, oftentimes they lose a lot of their possessions. What are the what are the chances that you're going to get all your stuff replaced? Well, and this ends up being one of the most complicated parts of the claim. Um, and especially when I was talking with people after hurricanes and also after wildfires and tornadoes, because in many cases, in those in those situations, you don't even have, you know, waterlogged stuff anymore. It's thrown throughout everywhere or just totally, you know, totally destroyed by fire. So it's really important ahead of time. Everyone, this time of year is just a good time to go through your house with your smartphone and do a home inventory. Just open closet doors open drawers, just be able to show everything that you have in your house and just keep that on the cloud somewhere. Keep keep a copy of that somewhere where it could be accessible if you do end up having a claim because that's going to be the hardest part. I mean, people tell me, you know, they've they've gone through the disaster. They are, you know, it's, it's a traumatic situation as it is. And then the insurance company says, here, give me a list of all the stuff you lost. And it's hard to remember everything. So just go ahead and, and go through that. Also, you know, if you have any valuable items. It's a good idea just to take pictures of that and store that on the cloud too. So you'll have all of that evidence if you really need it when the insurance company asks you to provide it all for a claim. So when you talk about valuable items, you know, my question is you, you hear about the tornado or the hurricane or whatever coming and you think it's time to get out of Dodge. I got to go, <laughs> like, go visit my aunt Sally in Cleveland. We're out of here. Uh, what if you're leaving the house with your stuff what should you be taking with you in terms of say valuables in terms of important documents that will really make your life easier post disaster so that's a great question. I mean, if you do have time, if you don't have that inventory yet, run through your house with your camera and take some <laughs> pictures. And, and I actually talked with someone after Hurricane Katrina who had done that. Uh, you know, sometimes you do have an evacuation warning and you do have some notice. So you can, you know, go through and do that. And she said it made a huge difference in her claim. So start with that. Also, a lot of people, and this is especially in areas that do have
have, you know, our storm prone areas tend to have something called a, a go bag. And uh, a lot of times they will keep some of their very important papers in there. This could be receipts for some of their valuable items, but also a lot of their important identification papers, um, whether it's their passports, their social security card, uh, even their birth certificate, their driver's license, some of those things that can make it much easier to get everything else reimbursed and everything else replaced later on. Because if you're missing all of those at once, it gets very, very difficult. Also, it's important to keep some cash. I mean, a lot of times after these disasters, the ATM stop working. And so it's just really important to have some of that on hand. And then key things like how to contact your insurance company. You know, a lot of insurance companies now have apps where you can start your claim um, or just key numbers. Um, also, during some disasters, people are evacuated far and wide for quite a while. And they'll have different ways to get in touch with their people, may even have people coming to the area and um, and just meeting with everyone all at once. So find out about, you know, the best way to get in touch with them. And just think about, you know, some of your some of your other things that would be um, difficult to replace and important to have, maybe a copy of, you know, of your will, some of your important legal documents, and just those key things. Have them in a place that's easy to grab and go if you need to. Well, there you have it. I mean, obviously, we're not wishing disaster on any of our listeners, but in the case that disaster does strike, it pays to be prepared. Kim, thank you so much for coming on and giving us this fantastic advice. Oh, it's my pleasure. If you're talking about a potential decline in stocks, make sure you have your terms straight. Explain Like I'm Five is next. For proven help to plan and enjoy a richly rewarding retirement and make sure your money lasts as long as you do, count on Kiplinger's Retirement Report. From maximizing your Social Security benefits to sheltering your savings from inflation and taxes to generating reliable monthly income to getting the best health care at the best cost, Kiplinger's Retirement Report will help you reap all the rewards you labored so long to earn. Download a free issue and see for yourself. No information is required from you. Visit store.kiplinger.com today. That's store.kiplinger.com. We're back. And before we go, we wanted to do another Explain Like I'm Five segment. And today I am the one explaining. And I am the five-year-old. And my five-year-old question to you, Ryan, is we have had a couple of really rough days in the stock market. Um, and there's a lot of talk about bears. So my question is, are we in a bear market? And if not, how will we know when we're in one? So given the recent market volatility, you are hearing a lot of that kind of language. You might hear people say the market's in a correction, we're headed for a bear market, we're headed for a recession. So it makes sense to make sure that we're getting our terms straight. So first of all, when we say the market, there's no, you know, p- there's no uniform thing that the market is. We're right. generally talking about um, one of the major indexes meant to serve as a proxy for the broad stock market. Uh, the ones who hear a lot are the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500 Stock Index. Uh, Kiplingers, we're generally referring to the S&P whenever we say the market mm-hmm. or the broad stock market. Um, you know, it's a market cap weighted index of the 500 or so biggest stocks by market size. Um, that is stock price times shares outstanding on the market. So essentially, the bigger the company, the more it's going to move the index. And we talked about the difference between uh, the major market indexes on a previous episode of our show. So go back and look for that if you'd like more detail. Um, When tracking these indexes, you're going to be listening to the radio. You have to make sure that you're paying attention to percentage drops. Oh, yeah, and not, not point points. drops. Correct. If the S&P 500 finishes the day down five points, that practically didn't it's even nothing. move the needle. Yeah. But if it finishes the day down 5%, that was a really bad day. That's a day. bad day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Really bad day. But, you know, that's a really good point because I can't tell you how often we'll turn on the news and they will only talk about points. Well, because it's a bigger number. But it's it's a bigger number because it's a bigger market than it used to be. <laughs> right. It's a bigger number, so it sounds worse. I'm old enough to remember when 200 was a lot. Yeah, <laughs> right. Now it's just, you yeah, know, whatever. Thursday or whatever. <laughs> so when we're talking about bear markets and corrections, if one of those aforementioned indexes drops uh, – by 10% on 
from a recent high, not 10 points, 10%. Uh -huh. That's considered a stock market correction. Okay. Now, we've had six of those since the beginning of the current bull market in 2009. All of these, you know, these numbers aren't universally agreed upon. Mm -hmm. People have sort of, you know, the definitions get squishy. For, you know, these are all coming from our friend uh, Ed Yardeni, but the people have different numbers. They're all going to be pretty similar okay. on this front. So we've had six since the beginning of the current bull market, which started in 2009. If the market slides 20% uh -huh. from recent highs, that's when you're in a bear market. That's a bear, okay. We've had 11 of those since 1945, the most recent being from 2007 to 2009. And since World War II, on average, bear markets last an average of about 13 or 14 months. And the S&P 500 has fallen by an average of 33.5% during those periods. Now, so, I mean, not the end of the world, if you mm -hmm. consider, you know, the sort of grand scope of market history. Um, and the last thing to mention are recessions. Right. Which I think in the sort of popular consciousness tend to get kind of conflated with right. or confused with. A bear with market. bear markets. Yeah. Now, recessions typically come about six to nine months after the peak mm -hmm. of a bull market. Now, obviously, that's always going to be a hindsight kind of thing, yeah. right? You don't know when the peak is until it has peaked, until, you, <laughs> it, until you're in a bear and you, go, you look back and go, oh, that was the Those peak. Those were good days. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> good times. <laughs> um, so the recession is – really, um, it's about a dip in the economy, not right. the market. So it's generally defined by two or more consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, um, that, you know, gross domestic product. Mm -hmm. And recessions come with a number of concerns, but the biggest, you know, perhaps the biggest is that consumers slow spending, businesses have to cut back, and people lose their jobs. But, you know, these things are um, related bear markets and recessions, but they're different. And knowing and understanding your terms hopefully uh, can make it so you're not freaking out and can sort of stay the course with your you know, investment picture. Right, because it sounds like corrections are pretty common. Um, and yes. we've had, you know, several of them and we may be in one now, but bears are less frequent and last a lot longer. Yeah, I don't know where the you know as of uh, as of our air date, I, I'm not sure where we are in, in relation to the top of the S and P 500. But generally speaking, corrections and even bear markets uh, for someone with a long uh, time horizon are opportunities to add to your holdings. You know, it's the, if someone told you that, and I think. Uh, uh, downtown Josh Brown uh, <laughs> made a, a similar analogy to this one. I don't know if I'm wholesale lifting it or not off the top of my head. But, you know, if Target said we're having 20% off everything at our store or if Walmart said, you know, we're having 10% off everything at our store, people would be – Thrilled. You know, be, yeah, beating mm -hmm. down the doors mm -hmm. to get in there. When the stock market says, hey, it, you know, it's 10 to 20% off – everything on, on the stock market, um, it should be, a, you know, an opportunity uh, for you to add to your holdings or at least to stay with your, in, you know, right. investing plan, investing at regular intervals. It's a way to lower the average cost of your investment and hopefully boost your returns over time. Right. Just as with real bears, you should not panic with a bear market, correct? <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Your Money's Worth. For show notes and more great Kiplinger content on the topics we discussed on today's show, visit kiplinger.com slash links slash podcasts. You can stay connected with us on Twitter at Kiplinger, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Kiplinger Personal Finance, or by emailing us at podcast at kiplinger.com. And if you like the show, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Your Money's Worth wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. For trusted advice to help you make more money and keep more of the money you make, sign up for the free Kiplinger Today daily email alert. From investing profitably in any kind of market to slashing taxes to the bare minimum, from planning and enjoying a richly rewarding retirement to maximizing your social security benefits, from locking in low rates on your mortgage, auto loan, or credit card to getting the best healthcare coverage at the best price, 
think of Kiplinger today as your go anywhere personal finance advisor. Visit kiplinger.com slash links slash K today on your laptop, tablet, or mobile phone to get Kiplinger today every day free. It's the one daily email you literally can't afford to miss. That's kiplinger.com slash links slash K today.